everyone. We are going to wait just a couple more minutes for people to join. Um, so go ahead and um, type in the comments below what your name is, where you're from, um, and who your favorite comic artist is or what your favorite comic book is. Give it just a couple of minutes. So if you guys didn't hear, uh, go ahead and write a comment just saying where you're from, um, you know, uh, what your name is and what your favorite comic book or comic artist is. So we're gonna give it a little bit of time um, to let people join. Some San Diego people, some Tennessee. Hi, guys. Hi, Marissa. Maryland. Oh, this is awesome. There's a lot of people from different states. Alrighty guys, we're gonna give it maybe one more minute and then we're gonna get started. So if you guys have a favorite comic book or a comic book character, or anything like that, go ahead and comment that as well. I love to see what you guys are into, what your poll list is, what you're reading, um, different things like that, so. Ooh, we have a couple of people from South Carolina, that's awesome. Maybe you guys can connect. So what will we need for today? You guys can have uh, drawing materials ready, but we're really just gonna kind of review some of the steps. And then I have a really cool challenge for you guys that I want you to try this weekend with your girls. Um, see if you can get your troop involved, uh, you know, and this is any age level. It technically covers for uh, the cadet comic book artist badge. Um, but if you're from a different age level joining in, we're more than happy to have you here. Um, it's always good to start that love for comics early, so. Um, but I think we're gonna get started. So my name is Rachel Wells. I am a program and partnerships manager uh, at the Girl Scouts of Western Ohio. I am located in the North region at the Toledo office. Um, and I'm really excited for us to work on the cadet uh, comic artist badge workshop today. So we're gonna cover steps one through three for this. Um, so step one is going to be delve into the world of comics. I'm going to show you guys some comic book examples. We're going to talk a little bit about comic structure with them as well. Um, what does color do in comics? You know, how do you portray motion in comics? Um, and I'll show you guys a couple of examples. And then we are going to go into uh, choose a story to tell. So I'll talk to you guys a little bit about how do you choose a story for comics? Um, how do you kind of narrow down that worldview so you don't have too many characters you're trying to focus on um, and really make it a kind of cohesive thing? Um, and then draw it out, which is going to be a challenge that I have for you guys. Um, and it's really cool. It actually comes from the online comic artist uh, community. So it's a tradition that's gone on for years and years. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit about it. So we are going to start by delving into the world of comics. So I have a couple of examples from my own comic book collection. Um, I am a self-professed comic nerd. Uh, I always have been. Um, so I'm going to pull some examples. And as I hold up the comic books, I want you to, if you're with your girls, um, ask them questions, you know, have them respond. Um, I'm going to be asking some questions to the audience. Uh, if you guys want to put a comment in response, that's totally perfect. So. One of the first things that I want to talk about with comic books and when we make comic books and we're when we're reading comic books is we want to talk about, um, you know, panel structure and how the comic pages are set up. So my example that I have right here is Batman, The Long Halloween. So if you guys are Batman fans, give a thumbs up. I'm a big Batman fan myself, um, although it seems like Marvel's pretty big right now. DC Comics are pretty good, too. 
So the comic artist for this comic book is named Tim Sale. So Tim Sale is the, um, he does the penciling, he does the drawings for this comic, and Jeff Loeb is actually going to be the writer for this comic. So just a little bit of information. They'll usually put it at the top of the comic to let you know who was the artist and writer on it. So the first page as an example that I want to show you guys is going to be this one right here. And if you know anything about Batman comics, you know the character, the Joker. And you notice that this is a very big panel on this page right here. It takes up the entire page. So there are a couple things I want you guys to notice about this, these pages. Ask your girls, what is the first thing that they notice? Because for me, the first thing that I noticed is that this page right here with the Joker's face is an entire panel. And you might wonder why an artist is gonna do that. So is it because the artist is lazy and doesn't wanna draw a whole bunch of little panels? No, not at all. It's usually because it's showing impact for a scene. So let's take a closer look at the scene right here. We see the Joker has paper in his hands. He seems to be laughing. If you guys know anything about the Joker, he's based on a clown character. So he, he's laughing about it. And then on the final page, this page right here, the second one, he says he hates that song. So he's laughing about it. And then we have a really close, intense zoom in on his face. You know, the previous page doesn't have a lot of color on it. And part of that reason might be because the artist wants to make sure that there's clarity in the image. So reducing the colors, making them muted tones, um, you know, it helps add gravity to the situation as well when the following page has a lot of intense color. So that's what we're focusing on. We're really focused on how the Joker may be laughing in these panels, but on the next page, he has a very intense face. And so comic artists will do that and have a page be a panel which is totally acceptable when you're making comic books to have a page be a panel to show impact, to show um, you know, that this is important for the viewer to see and for the viewer to see it in a really big format. You know, he's added a lot more color to that page so it has that intensity so that you're focused on it. Another really cool example that I have here, I'm gonna take a quick drink break. Green team. Another really cool example that we have as page as a panel is actually a spread is what we would call this in comic books. So this is a spread right here. And as you guys can see in the image, tilt it on side a little bit more, we have the Joker and Batman, of course, in some kind of battle embroiled in some kind of conflict right here. Um, but what I really like about this panel, and I want to point out to you guys and see if you guys notice it, is how both the Joker and Batman angular characters and in these panels right here we actually see a lot of circular patterns so look at the pattern of the joker's plane right here as it loops around into batman's figure so it's creating a circle it's moving your eye throughout the piece so you see and you loop around and you're getting all of the important information from this scene so Again, you saw a lot of vibrancy of color in that image too. Um, the red contrasting, there's no other red except for that plane, so it draws your eye to it. So thinking of the impact of color when you're making comic books is incredibly important. Um, color affects mood, color uh, draws the eye, so using it in very impactful ways like that is important when making comic books. Kind of a cool thing I wanted to show you guys here in the back of this is a little bit of that process of making comic books. So you can see the pencils that they do right here for their comics. You can see how there's a script to start with. And if I pull really close this way, you guys can see thumbnail images. So when you're working on your comics, and we're gonna challenge you guys to make some comics after this, but when you're working on your comics, don't be scared to start with thumbnail images. When you first do a drawing, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you can make it you know, as messy as you want it to. It can be stick figures until you get to that final piece. Um, a lot of comics is reworking. A lot of comic books are actually teams of people. You'll see this in American comics. You'll see this in Japanese comics, which are really popular. Um, there's a whole team of people that are working on these things to make this vision happen. Um, so asking a friend to help you with your comics is totally a viable thing you can do. You know, it's fun to get that community going. The next example I have, shockingly enough, it's another Batman comic, but this is Robin Year One. Um, this is one of my favorite comics. It has kind of a more cartoony style. Um, I would say Batman the Long Halloween is pretty stylized as well. It's not so much a realistic style. Things are bolder with really dark shadows and intensity. Um, but there's a page in this comic that I really like that is a good use of color and explaining color and how color can change a scene in a mood. 
So if you guys don't know anything about comic books, which is totally okay if you don't know the history of Batman and Robin, uh, Robin, the very first one, his name is Richard Grayson, Dick Grayson. He was an acrobat whose parents died in an accident at the circus. Uh, Batman or Bruce Wayne happened to be there at the same time and adopted Robin into the uh, Bat family, so to speak. Um, so the character of Dick Grayson is he's very vivacious, he's very bombastic, he's a, um, you know, a really charismatic guy but he really likes to be in his element. He's comfortable doing acrobatics. He's comfortable as Robin. He's not so comfortable with the Dick Grayson side and with being a part of the, um, the upper class parties he has to go to with Bruce Wayne. So these two pages, I think are the perfect example of that. Here we go. Are the perfect example of that. We see right here on this page, things are reversed, so it's a little bit hard for me. <laughs> but we see right here on this page, he's at a gala. He is not having fun at all. The colors are very dreary. The colors are very muted. You know, it's really tiny panels. There's a lot of text. It's kind of overwhelming, almost like something like this party might be for a character like Dick Grayson. This is a person who feels most comfortable doing acrobatics, using his body, being above Gotham. Being cramped like this and having to talk to people is not something he really likes to do. But we see on the reverse page, and I think this is a gorgeous splash image, is the intensity of color. So we see how when he's Robin, he is excited, he is in his element, he is yelling out in joy, he's saying yes, he's so excited. So it's a really good use to show how color can change that mood, you know, um, how panel structure can change that mood too. The really intense, tiny panels, they feel claustrophobic. But when we're above the city of Gotham, there's this beautiful intensity of color and there's this beautiful open panel. We feel free. After those really tense panels, we finally can open up and say, Whew, that feels good, you know? Um, so I really like this book as an example for that. Um, it has a really fun style too, which I think is important to note in comics. When you are thinking of making a comic and drawing, uh, think about the style that you'll feel comfortable using. If you start with something really realistic and you don't know if you can commit to that to the end, um, you know, think about how you might wanna simplify the things to make them a little bit easier. In things like sequential art, um, it's really a matter of uh, conveying um, emotion, it's conveying motion as well, and I think this Robin comic does a great job of conveying motion and movement. I really like this panel right here of Dick Grayson. He's throwing batterings in the air, they're kind of spiraling in a circle. So think about ways that you can show movement in your comics, you know, um, my little note right there, motion and open panels. Uh, the panels on this page are really cool too because if you notice, this main panel in the background doesn't have any borders. The borders are created by the panels that surround it. So think about different ways like that. How can you break up a page? Um, how can you really show motion within those pages and have it move from one panel to the next panel to the next panel? I have another cool example here, and this is for any of the audience who is a manga fan. So this is a manga called Delicious in Dungeon. It is by Ryoko Kui. Uh, she is also, um, in Japanese manga, they tend to have a team of people who will work on these comics. So it's not just her who's creating this comic book. She has a whole group of people who are helping her. Um, we saw in American comics that they tend to be in color. It's not always the case, but they do tend to have a inker, a colorer, a penciler. There's a lot of different roles in American comics to fill. So if you are someone who absolutely cannot sign inking things, but you love adding color to something, there is a job for you there. So um, there's a lot of different avenues in the comic book market. But in the case of Japanese comics, one of the cool things I wanna talk about is their use of adding depth and value. So consider these things when you open up your comic books. But this is Delicious in Dungeon. It's really fun. It's about a group of uh, essentially dungeon crawling people who are exploring a dungeon. Uh, they run into a dwarf who is a, um, a chef, and he's adept at cooking the different monsters in the dungeon. So they have to learn how to survive, and they have these really great images of the meals that they cook together. Um, it's a really fun comic book. But the cool thing about Japanese comic books that I really like is they do something called uh, screen tones. Now, screen tones traditionally um, in the manga industry were almost like stickers. So you buy a pack of screen tones, and there are a whole bunch of stickers that add value. So traditionally this image would have been created by potentially laying down big ink washes with something like a Fudo brush um, or something like even a Sharpie you could use to lay those down. 
and then putting screen tones in. So every area you see value and you see shadow, they would have used these type of stickers to lay them down. Now, in most manga now, they use computer programs, so they have simulated versions of that, but there are still some artists out there who kind of prefer the screen tone method and really like using it. So think about the way that you can uh, lighten the workload a little bit. There's nothing wrong with lightening your workload when you're making comic books, especially if you're making something kind of big. Um, you want to think about making it as easy as possible. So. And then the final example that I want to do for step one, um, to complete step one, is show you a comic called The Arrival by Sean Tan. And this is a really cool comic book. It has all pencil, no inking, just like that. And so it's all in black and white, it's all in pencil. And I really love these panels right here. I want you guys to kind of focus on. They're really cool. It's showing how you can convey motion, emotion, a lot of different things, even in black and white. So he's not using any kind of fancy materials. He's not using screen tones. He's just using black and white. He's using a pencil and paper and that's it. And that's what's cool about comic books. You don't need fancy Copic markers to make them. You don't need screen tones. You don't need any of these things. You really just need pencil and paper. So think about what you'd like to make your comics with. Do you want your comic books to be in full color? Do you want to um, have them just be black and white in ink? Do you want to just do ink washes? You know, comics are really flexible and cool. That's what I like about them. Um, and you know, it's a tradition as old as even the prehistoric cave paintings are a example of sequential art and of comic book art. So that is step one. We're going to move into step two now. Now step two is think about the story. So when you guys are thinking about a comic book story and when you guys are thinking of what you want to do, I recommend a couple of things first and foremost. Uh, first, I always like to, when I write stories, or even if I play games like Dungeons and Dragons with friends, I will have an idea of where I start and I'll have an idea of where I end. And then everything that comes in between is really just that, just that trajectory to get from point A to point B. So think about your cast of characters. In Batman comics, it usually focuses on Batman and Robin, and then they interact with other characters, but the crux of the emotion of that story is really happening between a small group of people. Um, when you start getting too many characters involved, it can be very confusing, it can be very hard to follow. Um, there are ways you can follow along, there are ways that you can keep track of that, but I really recommend keeping that cast of people really small. So when you make comics at home, think about who your cast of people could be. Do you want to do something autobi uh, autobiographical that is of your family? So maybe you guys are spending a lot more time together, um, you know, you want to write about your experiences during this time. Um, make it just about your family. Make it about you and a friend. Um, if you want to get fantastical, it can be about anything. But really start with an idea of where you want to start and where you want to end and who is the story about. And then you can start thinking about all those different details. If it is a story about your family, how do you feel when you're with your family? Do you want to use bright colors? Is there a time of day that you really love? You know, maybe during the day when you're doing schoolwork, things are a little bit drearier, you know, things are a little bit muted. And when you finally get to sit down for dinner, they're bright and colorful. So think about how you're conveying emotion through color. Think about how you're conveying emotion through um, image. So those are just a couple of things I want you guys to think about. And the final step, um, and I'm going to add a couple of links to for these things. So what I always suggest is you really just need pen and paper when you're making comics or pencil and paper. Um, but if you are lucky enough to have something like an iPad, there are awesome programs you can use to make comics. I personally use a program called Procreate, and I will add this in a comment at the end of the video for you guys. Um, it is an awesome software. It lets you do layers. It's really, really easy to use and it's super intuitive. I really recommend it and it's inexpensive. It's a one-time payment of $10 while some of these other softwares like Clip Studio Paint, it's like a subscription monthly. You, you don't want to get involved with that. So something like Procreate is super, super simple and easy to use if you want to utilize technology. Um, and then step three, which is going to be us delving into making comic books. So writing that story out, drawing it out. 
What I want to challenge everyone watching right now, all of the viewers watching right now, is a comic book tradition that has been on online comic communities for over a decade now. And it is called the hourly comic, or hourlies. You might see it a couple of different ways. And I'll post an example of one of my favorite comic artists. Her name is Lucy Neasley. Um, I'm going to post an example of her work on this video as well that I want you guys to take a look at. But the hourly comic is a comic book that for every hour that you are awake, you are going to draw one panel. So one panel per hour. It can be about what's happening in your day. So you got up and you ate breakfast and then maybe you did some schoolwork and then you watched TV for a little bit and then you went on a walk. So things like that. Or you can challenge yourself to make it a fantastical story. So it doesn't have to be about your daily life. It can also be about um, the things that you want to do. It can be about a space explorer, whatever you guys want to do. I would love it if you guys would work on these hourly comics. If you want to start smaller, you can always do the post-it note comics, which are super simple too. You just get a very easy post-it note, just like this. And that's your panel right there. So you have a panel already set out for you. You can arrange it however you want to. Um, and you can just start with a couple of those if you don't feel comfortable doing a whole day's worth of comics. Um, I'm also going to post a link to Scott McCloud. He is a comic book writer. He did a TED talk that is about um, how we think about comics and how we think about the structure of comics. He is a guy who is very analytical minded, but he ended up being a comic artist. Um, and one of the things he talks about is, you know, how you can have that analytical brain and still create um, and how he wanted to, as soon as he started making comics, understand how they worked. So he talks a little bit about that. So we talked a little bit today about delving into the world of comics. I'm glad you guys joined me for that. I hope you found some inspiration and I hope you find some inspiration in the links that I'll share with you guys. Um, we also, you know, talked about starting that story. How do you start a story? What do you want to focus on? Make some thumbnails, get that script, that point A to point B. Um, and then your homework is step three, which is going to be drawing it out. So I really want you guys to Try this, try that hourly comic. You know, Saturday's a perfect day to do it. You can even do just quick sketches. And then after you're done, you can trace over it and have your final image. And so one of the techniques I wanted to have you guys walk away with today too is the world's cheapest light box. And it's as simple as just having a window. So I'm gonna turn my computer around real quick so you can see my window right there. And as you can see, I have two pieces of paper up here kind of hard to see. There's a little Kirby underneath though. So I taped down my first piece of paper. I have a piece of painter's tape. I recommend painter's tape because it's less likely to rip your images, but painter's tape on each corner and a little drawing of Kirby in the center. And then put another piece of paper on top with just one piece of tape right here. So you can use it to flip up, check your work underneath, flip it back down and continue to do your tracing. And so the reason that we'll do things like tracings when it comes to comics is because it gives you a cleaner final piece of work. I know that I've worked on a drawing before where there's a thousand uh, pencil marks that I can't get out of it and I can't erase it hard enough and the paper loses its integrity. Um, and there's nothing wrong with most comic artists will do that. It's called inking or the inking stage where they trace over it with a light box, which they can be expensive, but hey, you guys have a light box right at your house. It's your window. So I hope you guys really liked this today. Um, we covered those three steps. You just gotta finish that last one as a little bit of homework. Um, and I am going to add some of those links to this video after it is over. Um, so I'll add that TED Talk as well as the two examples of hourly comics that Lucy Neasley did. So I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, I hope you get outdoors and I hope you get creative. Have a good one, guys.